Well, hello, everyone. I'm Reverend Carla. Welcome to Spirituality Matters. And now I invite you to settle into that sacred space where between here where I am and there where you are. And let us be reminded that the holy transcends our physical bodies. And our time together is just as sacred and meaningful as if we were sitting beside one another. Okay, so now let's get started. Today's podcast is titled Rescuing Christianity from Radicalization. Now, this is a continuation of a conversation that we've been having for several weeks. It actually began on TikTok when I did a six-part series called The Radicalization of American Christianity. And from there, it has just just snowballed into several videos because people are very interested about this. It's helped people understand a little bit about what's going on in the political climate here in America, as well as understanding your own experience. Because once again, I speak to the person who is now spiritual, but not religious, recovering from some kind of religious trauma that's most likely related to Christianity. And so for me, today's topic is actually a lifetime in the making because I had been attempting to rescue evangelical Christianity from the inside for years. And I want to start also by saying that it doesn't necessarily to be need to be rescued across the board. What I was talking about was how it has become radicalized. And in many aspects of my own religious experience, that's exactly what I was dealing with, was um, church experiences where theology was radicalized. And so if you have not seen that six-part series on TikTok, I invite you to go back and take a look at that and just see some of the conversations and the way those videos have touched people and the conversations that they have ignited. So primarily, now I, looking back over my religious experience, I can see that I was definitely seen as an antagonist. And that wasn't a label that I necessarily gave myself. It was, it was a label that was planted on me because what I was often told was that my questions about the Bible and different translations or how they seem to be translated one way for one group of people, but they meant something different for another group of people, especially if they ended up related, if the people that they were changing the meaning of the scripture, if they were related, they seem to be related to church leaders or the ministers, a whole other set of rules dictated how you handled certain situations. So I always had questions and those questions meant I lacked faith. That was that was the response I often got. So then I was also did not understand this uber obsession with condemning gays um, that was that you often see from church me- members and you still see that. And so when when I would question why are we so uber focused on condemning gays, I, that was seen as a weakness in my part, that I wasn't accepting the literal translations of the Bible to accept the fact that being gay was a sin. I didn't accept it then, and I don't accept it now. We'll do a whole series on being gay is not a sin, and I'm sure we'll we'll visit that several times throughout these podcast series. And of course, I've done quite a few videos and teachings on that already on Instagram and, and um, TikTok. But long before I I long gone I was long gone from evangelical Christianity when Trump entered the scene. But having been inside that mindset and had having been deeply indoctrinated into this belief system for years, I understood what was happening. I could see it happening, and I was very concerned when people were still dismissing his ability to get elected in this country. I was very concerned because I understood who he was talking to and why what he was saying resonated with them deeply. And I have to be honest that even after he was elected, I was largely ignored. Even among some of the most staunchest of advocates pushing back on Trump and his supporters who just didn't see or understand this bridge to belief and the evangelical vote for Trump. They were primarily focusing on the white supremacists, the racists, 
But And make no mistake about it, they are certainly a problem and very prevalent inside the Trump base. But white supremacy has been hiding in plain sight inside Christianity for, se- for centuries. Now, we're not going to get into a lot of history today because I've already done that in uh, several episodes back on the podcast. So you can go back and, and watch the radicalization or listen to the radicalization of Christianity. And you can see and listen to that history that really started when white European, primarily European uh, humans started to come over and through this divine ordinance through this pro- this providential proclamation that everything they did was God ordained and blessed, they felt justified in annihilating entire indigenous people populations and justified in deceiving them and tricking them or whatever they need to do because they were doing it for the glory of the Lord. This has been going on for years. Now, I also feel like this is a a little bit of out of order because I talked about the history of the radicalization of American his- history, and I can I feel like we need to do a little bit more of that and talk about how and why they're still entrenched. But because I've had such a good response to these video series, and a lot of people wanting to say, "What do we do about it? How can we push back on this?" It's time for me to give you some tools, and that's what this, what today is about. So, just to give you a little background, the video I did on TikTok was um, I shared a video clip of a preacher from Louisville, Kentucky, and that clip will be in the show notes. His name is Bob Rogers, and it's part of the Bob Rogers ministry. But in that, he says he's placing a curse of God on those he is accusing of stealing this election from Trump. It's a ridiculously arrogant prayer. And if it weren't so revealing of the toxicity inside this type of thinking, it would be funny or outlandish. It actually has the air of a child telling a parent to go to their room. There's not much power there. And it's just so cute to see a child trying to use those same kind of influence or those same kind of words on a parent. That's kind of the way it felt because there is no authority or basis for any minister to invoke that kind of nonsensical language in any kind of prayer. So his his exact words were not only cursing God, he cursed their livelihood. He cursed their bodies. So this is something that it, it, it goes on, and please watch the clip. Now, the video it is still in, in different ways is going viral. The clip I did, but also out there in the internet. And there have been all kinds of, of responses to that video. So there were a handful of Trump supporters that came at me pretty hard. And I'm not going to engage in that kind of uh, engaged dialogue with with, uh, very diehard Trump supporters. I just block them. And I'm I'm not surprised at all because there were several people I I would guess, you know, hundreds of people in that prayer circle that had their hands raised in agreement to what the preacher was saying. So of course, if they see my video or someone who is supportive of that, that's exactly how they're going to view me as once again, as the antagonist. Now this minister has tried to scrub the internet of that video and he staunchly defended it at the beginning. He said that that the clips that we're showing are taken out of context, but his words, my friends, cannot be mistaken. You know exactly what he is saying. But back to the Trump Trump supporters, here's something else that we must be mindful of. When you offer a mirror to someone to reflect back what the world sees about them, about what they're doing, but they are not ready to see that truth, be prepared to have the mirror slapped out of your hands. So this is applies for us as well. So those of us who think that we are being well-intentioned and perhaps offering our wonderful, gracious insight to someone, if they're not ready to hear it, you're going to get some kind of backlash. You're going to be seen as the person who is confronting them for no reason at all when they're comfortable with who they are. 
So I can't be surprised by that pushback, but I'm also, the reason why I made those videos is not to talk to them. So the reason why I'm on any social media platform or even here is not to change their minds. And I've said this countless times. I'm here to help the person who's on a spiritual but not religious journey or someone who's recovering from religious trauma. Because those two subsets of people, a lot of times they're the same person, has been largely ignored. They have been like I have, which has kind of been out here floundering in the spiritual wilderness. Some of us accepting the fact that we think that our one conduit to the divine has been cut off because we're still filtering through our belief system that somehow our faith can only be handled through church. And even though we no longer want to endure some of what we experienced inside that, it is worth it to us to have that disconnection if it means that we can have peace here. But what we end up finding out, my friends, is that we have never lost that connection. It has always been here and been for us. So then then another response that I got to that video is a few who said, okay, I get it. That's really bad. I'm a Christian, but that's not my minister. And that's not my church. So stop telling me that I have to do something about it. Okay, so the first part, the Trump supporters, I'm going to just, I'm just going to block this. I'm going to push back a little bit on this because first of all, let's be reminded that Christianity here in America is declining. Now, another way of saying that is that it is dying, my friends. So I'm going to share some links once again that proves all the data about this. I keep sharing this, but I think it's important for us us to see this, that this is quantifiable, accurate data that shows you that the largest growing population in America is the spiritual, those who identify as spiritual, but not religious. So there is something going on inside Christianity that has nothing to do with us. If you ask Sometimes uh, denominational um, reports will come out that will talk about why people are leaving leaving church, but it's often very misdirected. For instance, they'll say something like, well, you haven't been clear on your message, or people want convenient spirituality, and that's certainly not the case. The one thing I've noticed about this spiritual path that I'm now on has been some of the most difficult work I've ever done in my life. You talk about a, an accountability like no other, but it does take work, and it does take discipline, because now I understand that how I show up in the world is a reflection of my spiritual growth. Before my focus was always on salvation, which led me to have a very arrogant attitude about how I existed inside the world because I my focus was on something out there. So th- this is not about spirituality light. So I think sometimes those the why people are leaving also mis- misdirects the church to truly understand why people are leaving. So like I said, there's a lot of uh, reasons for this for these shifts, but no one can ignore the face of Christianity that was seen at the insurrection on January 6th. When you had scores of those yellow signs of people, most, you can assume they were Christians holding up signs that said Jesus saves. And there is a, there is a video uh, out there that I can put in the show notes. Let me make a note of that so that I don't forget, that shows you exactly one of the persons who was holding one of those signs and what her thoughts were about why she was there holding that sign. Or how about the ones praying on the Senate floor who invoked the name of Jesus, thanking God for allowing Capitol Police to give them access into the Capitol building. So for the work they were doing for the glory of the Lord, all for the glory of the Lord, that is the primary face of Christianity that people are seeing. And that's not your problem. I've had more than hundreds of people tell me that they will no longer wear a cross because they, are, they fear of having a stigma placed on them that's associated to the radical, radicalized Christian that's the main face of Christianity right now. So... What this feels like when you say that you have no responsibility for this demise 
of Christianity, for this radicalized sector of Christianity that now has a prominent face inside America, is that this this feels a little bit like you're saying, I'm going to go to my picture window, I see that my neighbor's house is on fire, but you know what, I'm in the middle of a really good movie, and I don't want to be disturbed, so it's just not my problem. I'm going to close those windows and just hope that the sirens that's going to be blaring soon don't interrupt my sleep. I'm, You know what? I'm, I was going to say I'm sorry if that offends you. I'm not sorry if that offends you. I know that's a wild analogy, but how can your faith not be impacted by those who are distorting it? How can you distance yourself from that and not want to either understand it or make sure that you are not identified as it? And the only way you can do that is by standing up against it. So that brings me to the vast majority of people who are absolutely shocked by this video clip that I shared in my video. Many are definitely disgusted and they are angry because for many of us who rejected organized religion um, was completely because of this type of experience. And it's even been triggering. If you go through and read some of the comments, it's heartbreaking to hear how these are not isolated incidents. There's pastors all over the country right now preaching this kind of toxic theology inside their churches. But here's what gives me hope. It's not even just the fact that people feel safe to tell their stories inside my video comments. It's the number of Christians who say, I'm outraged. I cannot believe this. This is not my religion. This should not be what people see and think is Christianity. What can I do? How can you help me find something to do? How can I get more information about this? How do I actively push back? And that is what today is about. What can you do? And this is really for anyone who wants to let their voice be heard because this is impacting all of us. For four years, our nation was held hostage by a man who moved us as close to an authoritarian country than any other time in our nation's history. So if we don't look at this as our, teach, as our moment in time, as our moment in history, as our teaching moment, history will indeed repeat itself if we do not take this time now to start take, making changes, and that includes inside religion. So here are a few things that you can do. Number one, educate yourself understand how this radicalization began. You can start with something as simple as my six-part series on TikTok and the and the uh, recurring videos that the, the preceding videos and the, the videos that followed regarding that subject. I would also invite you to read a book called Religious Intolerance in America. A second edition just came out in 2020. It's a wonderful book. It's a hard read. It starts with the founding of this country, and it walks you through several instances where r religious intolerance impacted some major decisions that led to a lot of heartache, a lot of trauma, a lot of death. So it's an important part to understand where we are right now because all of that trickles up to today. Now, for those of you who, have, who don't understand the connection between white supremacy and the radicalization of, of Christianity, it is time for you to accept that, my friends. This is very hard. So I'm sp speaking specifically now to the white individual because I certainly don't hold myself up as being the person who's speaking on behalf of black people. They, have, they deserve their own platform, and we need to step out of the way to allow them to do that. This is a gateway to get you to understand that it is time for us to listen to the Black people and understand it's time for their voices to be heard. So we do that first by understanding that white supremacy has had a long history with Christianity. So I would encourage you, first of all, to look at two books. One is uh, How to Be Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Uh, 
The other one is White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo, and I'll put copies of those in the show notes so you can find them easily. But there's also going to be in the show notes a couple of articles that I think you should you should um, research. But you can go online anytime. Don't just listen to me. Go on anytime and talk and and do how Christianity became radicalized in America white supremacy is tied to Christianity. Any one of those, you're going to find very good articles, substantive articles that have been vetted, that are qualified, that aren't biased against one religion or another. It's just going to talk to you about the straight facts of, the, of a, the, our country's history. But a couple that I found very interesting is America's Christianity's American Christianity's white supremacy problem, and that was in the New Yorker. Again, there'll be links in the show notes. One more by NPR is white supremacist ideas have historical roots in U.S. history. And the last one that that was from by NPR, and then one from Bloomberg, Bloomberg that's called the theological roots of white supremacy. So there's there's all kinds of things out there that you can start to do to educate yourself because if you are interested and you are concerned, it is your responsibility to ed- educate yourself so that you have those talking points at the ready when you want to either ask questions, informed questions, or you can push back when you feel that there is a reason that you need to stand up and use your voice. Now, another thing that you can do is look at your spiritual community. What is your spiritual community doing, especially for those of you who are in church? What are your church leaders doing? Have they made a statement about the connection of white supremacy with Christianity? What have they what have they talked to you about? What kind of, what kind of responsibility have they taken on so that you understand what it means? The, the roots of Christianity and how we got to where we are today. How does your spiritual community or your church hold space for sacred activism inside your church? I one time uh, recently heard an evangelical preacher say something about progressives, which I would be considered one um, because of, I, you know, I don't take the Bible literally in so many ways. I, I Yes, I believe there it has a historical cons- significance and, of course, inspirational significance. It's still something that I use and uh, apply and research regularly. But he said about social justice movements, he said these so-called social justice movements. And the perception there is very marked. It's about to you to question, is there really need for social justice movements? And uh, yes, the answer is 100% yes, there is. So what has your church done to separate itself from that face of radicalized Christianity? I am often told by that response, and you'll see some of those comments inside some of, some of those videos on TikTok, is my preacher preaches only radical love and acceptance. We would never be identified as one of those. Well, okay, so maybe that's okay, but I'm also going to push you to an uncomfortable space here because this needs to be said. Sometimes the love all, we love everyone, we welcome everyone, can, not always, but it can be very toxic. Because sometimes it's used as a deflection. Oh, we just love everybody. Well, I just asked you a specific question about what your church is doing to address radicalization of Christianity. What are you doing to help the social justice movements? What are you doing to address white supremacy in Christianity? What are you doing to address systemic racism in America? And you come at me with loving all. That's, that, that's a deflection on what really needs to be happening. So that necess- doesn't necessarily mean that your church is actively involved. It could be a deflection. I'm not saying it is in all cases. I certainly understand. I have, think I have one, a shirt that says love everyone. I get that the sentiment behind it, but if it's something that just keeps you in a comfort zone so that you can pretend you're doing something, then it's part of the problem. This is the same reason that 
black people do not want to hear from us white people that we don't see color. It's the same kind of analogy. So in other words, if we're just saying that we love all, we're putting a blanket on a problem. And when we white people say that we don't see color, it often feels, as I've been told by black people, that we do not recognize their culture, that they are different, that they are beautiful just as they are, and we should respect those differences and allow their uniqueness to have as much a sacred space in our societies, in our rituals, in our event plannings, whatever it is, as it has been predominantly white in America. So just just something to think about as you are looking at how your spiritual community or you are taking responsibility for anything that's related to what I call sacred activism and how important that is because it is a reflection of our spiritual growth, how we, re, how we respond, how we connect to those around us. So let's just get back to life here for a minute because I want to take just a little bit of a detour here. Churches across this country should be willing to face American Christianity's link to white supremacy. There is, that to me is non-debatable, non-starter, non-negotiable, inarguable. Because since the beginning, like I said, at the founding of this country, but also the Bible has been used to justify slavery. The Bible was used to suppress the vote for women. The Bible has been used continually throughout years. So how are we going to learn about it, educating ourselves, and then take action. Now this last one, friends, I'm going to ask you to go a little bit deeper. This is for your own self-reflection. It's also for me. The teacher teaches what she needs to hear. So I always pay attention to anything that that arises for us to, to, to spend time with here in this podcast time. But now I'm offering you a mirror. Remember earlier I said that Don't be surprised when you offer insight to someone who doesn't necessarily want to hear it and they smack the mirror out of your hands because they do not want to see their reflection. Are you going to knock it out of my hands when I ask you about your own biases and your own prejudices and how those are showing up in your world? Because here is a fact. We are are influenced by these biases. We received them in our homes. We received them in our schools. We received them in our churches. I even know that in my school experience, I was told in sixth grade I was going to hell because I wasn't baptized as a child. That terrified me. I was told by a history teacher that a black person has to spend two to three hours a day in the sun or they'll die. These are, and, and so no, there wasn't a black person in the, in the school to dispute that. We were pred- predominantly white. And then I remember in high school being told by an English teacher that um, we didn't have to study the part about being gay um, because, or write about it because There has never been a gay person who had come through our schools. And what an ignorant statement that is. What that really was saying was there was never someone who felt safe enough to be seen in that school as being who they were. There's absolutely no way that that was true. Truth in my own church experience, I remember attending when uh, in the 80s, attending an eight-week study on what was wrong with every other world religion and why everyone else besides Christians were going to hell. I believe that was actually the title of the entire series. It was an eight-week series, and it covered it on every religion, and the room was absolutely packed. It was standing room only, and I had my little tablet there, and I was taking copious notes on why everyone else was going to hell except the Christian. Now, if we look that, expand that out, and I want you, before we move on though, I want you to pause a minute and think about those kinds of experiences in your life and how they may still be impacting you. 
because once we own them and under and we understand because I have countless more those are just what ar- arise for me now but how do you have those kinds of experiences in your life and how have they impacted you are they still a, a truth for you that you filter your biases and your prejudice and your experiences with other people or your voting power through those biases or prejudices. Now, if we expand that out a little bit, we can see how it plays out on the national national front here in America. When uh, there was a GOP senator who, and I'll put this in the in the notes as well, where he intentionally mispronounced Vice President Kamala Harris's name. He said something like. Kamala, Kamala, Mala, 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 whatever her name is. Like, it doesn't matter. As if the pronouncing her name or the the uniqueness of her name minimized her value. He knew intentionally what he he was doing. So we've got a little bit of of racial and sexist, sexist prejudices going on there. But it was very prominent. It will be in the show notes. Another one that you may not have heard of is an Atlanta Atlanta pastor called Louis Giglio. He's a mega uh, church pastor in in Atlanta. And I just love this. I remember when it was happening that he hosted a a, a forum on racism. But what I found interesting when I saw that it was happening was that there were two white men on on the stage and one black man. Okay. Note to self, white people should not host a forum on racism and be the majority on stage. It doesn't matter who you are. If you have influence and you want to give your stage to black people to offer it, that's absolutely fine. But to be the one to filter how the conversation is going to go is just another example of white privilege. And it got bad for good old Louie. Here's what ended up happening. In the middle of that, where they were talking about white privilege, he tried to, Giglio tried to change the the wording of white privilege to white blessing because that just felt more comfortable. People were really upset about white privilege, but white blessing felt more comfortable. He got blasted for that. And he apologized, which is good. But unfortunately, when I go to his website, I don't see very many people of color, if any, on his staff. So how much did actually did his apology change him? He said he was going to do better. So and maybe he has, but all I'm doing is looking on his website and I'm not seeing very many people of color, if any. It's been a m- one month or so, so I'll go look again and see what I can find. In my own experience during, um, I studied for th- Uh, four years before I went on to seminary. And during that time, a classmate of mine, I don't want to say which part of my experience, um, but a classmate of mine dismissed how she mispronounced one of our one of our deans who was an esteemed woman of color. I mean, this woman was is highly educated, highly respected, just a joy to be around and she did have a unique name and when this this uh, classmate of mine got up to speak she mispronounced her name and she's and she said something like oh whatever I can never get your names right get your names right as if she just grouped her into a group of people and didn't feel like she deserved enough respect to know how to pronounce her name friends that's racist So we don't even realize where we think we're doing it because we have been given the right to do that. And people don't feel like they have the right to speak out against it. So that's just a handful of the examples of what I can talk about inside my own experiences. And let me tell you right now, and this happens all the time, it is not, not enough to say, well, I'm not, I'm not homophobic, my best friend is gay. I'm not racist. My boyfriend is black. I'm not against other religions. My roommate is Jewish. I'm not xenophobic. My roommate is from another country and he's, he's, my best friend is from another country and he's Muslim. So because all that, you, we don't have any idea what that relationship is like because we're not talking to those people. Are you a, an assimilator? So in other words, you invite these people into your life to assimilate into your comfort zone. 
Are you in effect colonizing them into what you feel are comfortable? Or are you inviting them as in their unique self to be who they are and be come along into your life as an equal? Those are, those are questions. You very well may be doing just that. You very well may be doing it right. If you're a little defensive, then maybe there's something there for you to look like, look at. If you hear what I'm saying and you say, no, I'm, I think I'm doing this right, but you know what? I'm going to go talk to my friend and ask them how I show up. Ask them if I'm doing anything that makes them feel less than, that somehow I'm marginalizing them with my language or things that I do. That would be a really good start. Because here's the thing, religious beliefs should not be the filter through which we determine basic human rights. I'm going to say that again. Religious beliefs should not be the filter through which we determine basic human rights, especially in a free and fair society. Because you know what, I'm, I'm white. I know that, that because of that, I'm afforded specific privileges. And if you are white, you will have two. But here's the truth. Someone along the line, especially if you are a woman, if you are black, if you are uh, a, a male, black person, someone fought for your right to be free. Someone fought for your right to vote. Women, someone fought for your right to vote. Someone fought for your for there to be biracial marriages in this country. Someone fought for your right if you're a woman to own property. Someone fought for your right if you're a woman to be able to have custody of your children. Those things were rights that were taken away from us just based on who we are, how we showed up in the world. So we need to look at when we consider now that we, if we accept systemic racism exists, and it does, if we accept that homophobic, homophobia is a, is a problem in this country, and it is, then we have to accept that there are people, and let's hope it's not us, but this is the time where you're looking in the mirror. Are you comfortable that you've got to cross that bridge and your rights are protected, but you could care less if that bridge is burned now? Even though your brothers and sisters are on the other side of that canyon with no way to get over here, who are just as brilliant, just as deserving, probably more talented, with more gifts to give this, this country, and we're okay with that bridge being burned. So the question I'd like to leave you with is, at what point does your faith become more important than another human's right to exist as freely as you do. One more time, at what point does your faith become more important than another human's right to exist as freely as you do? And amen. This will be an ongoing conversation, my friends. This is not over. Now we're at a point in our country where we are healing so we need to find time to continue to have these conversations. And if they're not uncomfortable, then we're not doing our jobs. So for now, though, beloveds, I'll leave you with saying I'm honored to be in this space with you. And I pray that you did receive something. I know I did because the teacher teaches what she needs to hear. And now, beloveds, go in peace and be at peace. Go in love and may you be loved. Go and know that others are on this journey with you and you are not alone. You are seen and deeply and unconditionally loved just the way you are. Blessings on your week and I will see you soon. Bye for now. Thanks for tuning in to another Uncut episode of Spirituality Matters. To submit questions to Rev Carla, email us at spiritualitymatters at revcarla.com. Follow at Rev Carla on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Pinterest for more spirituality teachings. Check out her blog posts at RevCarla.com and sign up for email alerts while you're there so you don't miss a thing. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos. Bye for now!